There are many different approaches that we can take to dependency injection inside of ASP.NET Core. Personally, one of my favorites, aside from just the iService collection that's built in, is to use a NuGet package that's called Autofac. But even when it comes to using Autofac, there's many different approaches that we can go with. Hi, my name is Nick Cosentino, and I'm a Principal Software Engineering Manager at Microsoft. In this video, I want to go over the most common way that we can set up Autofac to use inside of an ASP.NET Core application and talk about what the pros and the cons are of it. I felt like this was important to go over because if you don't understand what you get and what you're missing by doing this approach, you can't make informed decisions and you might get tripped up a little bit later when you're looking for some behavior that you don't have access to. A quick reminder to subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this kind of content and check out my pinned comment for my courses on Dome Train. So I wanted to start this off by mentioning that not long ago I put together this quick blog article to address exactly one of the challenges with working with Autofac. And that's because I was setting up another application and starting from scratch, I kept getting tripped up with the best way to set up the container. Now, is this the best way or is this just the common way, right? And the reality is that this is just the common way. This is how they explain to you how to configure the container. So what you end up doing is skipping some of the legacy stuff that they used to have. It's marked as obsolete. And then you'd be able to jump right into using these two lines to be able to configure your host, or you could do it all in one line. So this is the common pattern. And we're going to walk through that in this video to see what you get and what you're missing. I felt like one of the best ways to get started here was using the sample weather application because I don't need to come up with some totally contrived thing. You can go make this on your own and see how it all works. So if I collapse some of the auto facts stuff and we just look at what we have access to, right? We have the builder that's going to be creating our web application. You'll see this one liner that comes from the blog post I mentioned that's basically use service provider factory and then we can figure it with auto facts. So we'll look at that in more detail. But then later, we're going to build the application off of the web application builder. And then this is just to have HTTPS, not really important for this demo. And then from there, we add our route onto the application. I've gone ahead and extended this because I wanted to make sure that we could play with some things that would show us what we can and cannot do with this type of dependency injection. So this is the sample weather app, but I've gone ahead and I've added a few parameters onto our minimal API. And I'm going to walk through what those do in just a moment. Otherwise, the rest of this is basically the same type of thing. The weather forecast uh, record that we have is the return type. But these three new records are, or I guess these are classes. These are going to be slightly interesting because they have to use some type of dependency injection. So the, the thing that I want to show you if I scroll back up is if we go to the minimal API, these are things that we can resolve from services as this attribute suggests. And that means that the dependency injection framework, when this route is hit by a caller, will look to be able to provide these as parameters into our method. I just wanted to call out that this from services attribute is not required for this to work, but we're going to see some things that make this a little bit interesting and from services will make this a little bit more clear once we encounter that. Going back down, these are three different types of dependencies that I put together and you might be saying, well, why would you ever have these? And the reality is that I might not need them on something like our minimal API here, but this is going to show us a couple of examples where we can and cannot resolve dependencies. And the reason I picked these three is because I have situations for creating plugin architectures in ASP.NET Core. That will be follow-up content. This is really the primer that I'm trying to build up to. So in the future, if you're trying to build ASP.NET Core plugin architectures, this type of thing, in my opinion, will be extremely helpful for understanding how that works. So when I go to build plugins and I'm hooking different things up, I want to be able to have access to this web application builder because I may want to create plugins that can help configure the web app before it's built. I have other situations where I need to use the uh, application itself. This doesn't need to be lazy. This was me trying to play around and see if I could make Autofac do the right thing. So this does not need to be on here. In fact, we can go take that right off. And then this last one here, dependency C, is for the configuration. For me, this is really common that when I'm creating plugins or other features that use Autofac or dependency injection in general, I want to be able to access stuff that's in the configuration. And that's because I'm basically setting things up in environment variables when I deploy, and I want to read in that config for my feature. 
these are three different things, not these dependency A, B, and C that I need, but the, uh, the dependencies that they take in as these primary constructor parameters. So these are three things that I generally want. And the reason that I put them on the minimal API is because there are situations where being able to have access to these is doable, but not from the minimal API. So there's basically like these four things that I want to put together, right? These dependencies down here that I just walked through and whether or not we can access them on the minimal API. Now that we have that covered, I'm going to go back over to this part of the code where we can see how we're setting up our container. And I wanted to show that the first thing we're doing is we're registering the actual uh, web application builder. So not to be confused with the container builder, there's two different builder patterns going on here. So we put the web application builder onto the autofat container builder, a little bit confusing. Um, then from there, we are going to take the configuration off of the web application builder. And you'll see that the syntax I'm using here, I'm just trying to resolve the web application builder. Technically, I don't have to do that. I could just basically use builder right here because we already have access to it. Again, this is a little bit of proof that I can go resolve the web application builder if something goes and asks for the configuration. So far, if you're paying attention, you'll realize that these are two different things that I have on dependency A, B, and C that we just looked at at the bottom of this file, right? Now, the other three things that we're going to register onto this container are dependency A, B, and C themselves. These are just going to be single instance because they're just being used for references to these different services that I want. We looked at registering these three things, and then we said these are two examples of things we want, but what about the actual web application itself? Not the builder, but the thing that gets built from it. Well, that's down here. So if I go run this, one of the challenges that we're about to see is that we don't have access to the web application that was built. It's never been added to the container. So let me go ahead and run this. And when the minimal API is hit, so when we go to access that weather forecast route, we'll see that we get an exception that comes up. And there we go right in front of our faces here. It says dependency B can't be invoked with available services. It can't find a web application. That's exactly what I was just saying. That's not been put onto the container, right? So, so far, that's one sticky issue. So if I expand this little comment here, I have a fix me here saying, hey, look, we can't put the web application onto the container. That means we can't have anything that requires it as a dependency. So this is one limitation. Now you might say, okay, well, maybe we just figure out a way to get that onto the container, right? Cool. Before I jump over to how we do that, I wanted to call out that when it comes to resolving dependencies, these get resolved in order. So we were able to prove that dependency A was resolved. Okay, because it ended up failing on dependency B. It didn't fail immediately on dependency A. And just to kind of prove what can be resolved by default, I'm going to put these in a different order. And we'll see if B is still the only one that comes up and it still is. So that means dependency A and dependency C out of the box work for us, right? That means we get the configuration that's accessible and we get the web application builder that's also accessible. Web application itself is the only one of these three that is not accessible. I'll pause there because if you're building systems and you want to be able to have a plugin architecture, let's say, or just have other things that can be able to access these things off of the Autofat container, you're doing okay if you don't need the web application. If you just need the config and the web application builder, this will work perfectly fine for you. We can look at this bit of code here and we can try to see if that's even possible for us. So if I go remove this comment, what this might look like is we say, okay, we have this container builder. Let's go do what we were doing with the other things, right? Let's go use this registration method. We're going to ask for the builder and we already have that. We proved that we could do that by accessing the configuration. So let's go ask the builder. Let's go ask for the reference of it and then call build so we can go build the application, right? So we're basically taking these lines of code from down below. Oh, that's a spoiler. Don't look at that. Down below, taking these lines, right? And trying to put that on the container. But the reason that this doesn't work, and I just want to explain this because the life cycle of this is a little bit weird, is that 
In theory, this would put a web application onto the container for us. So that would go onto the Autofact container. But the only way that this resolution ends up happening is because we asked the web application builder itself to go build it. So we need to call this method in order to even have these different registrations take effect, which seems kind of weird. Now, that doesn't work because it's almost like a chicken and the egg problem. We need to call this basically down here in order for all of these registrations to start getting resolved, which means then later on we would go do this again. And that's the tricky part. We don't have the reference to the application we wanted to build. We're essentially building a new one as we're trying to build the first call to it. Again, a little confusing. It's a chicken and the egg problem. So this does not work. We can't go ahead and do that, unfortunately. Um, let me go put that other comment back in. So that doesn't work. And I guess I'm going to expand this in just a moment. But the idea here is so far, we only have web application that we don't have access to. You might be saying, well, Nick, maybe I don't care about that, right? I already said if you had access to those two other things and that's all you needed, you're essentially good to go at this point. Like you're, you don't need to be, you know, trying to figure out how to get access to this web application if you don't need it. One of the situations I mentioned plugins that I want to be able to use this is that I like having my routes be pulled into what I would call like vertical slices features. So if I'm doing like a plugin approach, which really helps me structure for vertical slices, that means that I can't register routes at least by going onto the application itself and doing map get or map post, whatever it happens to be. So I really need access to this web application in order to have features or plugins that can dynamically register their routes. Could this be done in a different way? The answer is most certainly there's going to be workarounds for this, but if I want access to the web application itself, how might I go about that? Okay, now we're going to expand this last comment because I want to show you that this is how it would normally look for me if I were using Autofac with a plugin. And basically all that I'm doing is I'm pulling the code we just looked at. It's the exact same, right? I've just copied and pasted it into another uh, registration. This one's going to be a build callback. So it's a little bit different. This just gets called when the builder is building. So it doesn't have to rely on someone else to resolve it it will go run automatically when the container is built. In the future, we're going to see how we're going to move away from this. It's not the pattern that I like using. In fact, to me, this kind of thing is a bit of an anti-pattern for the most part with working with Autofac. But this is what we would want to do. We would want to say, hey, container, get me the web application because once I have access to it, I want to go register a route. In this given example with the weather uh, forecast route, this is overkill. We don't need it. It's one route. We're not making a plugin for it. But if I wanted to go build plugins with different routes, this is the kind of code that I would want to pull into those individual plugins. The point that I'm trying to get at here is this indeed will not work. And I think if I go run this, we'll see that in just a moment, as long as I didn't miss any compile errors. And I didn't, but you'll see, right? It's running the build callback and it's telling us you can't do this. It's the same problem that we saw on the minimal API itself when it was being accessed, but you can't do this because web application was never put onto the container. Okay, so that was a whole lot of what you can't do with this, but I should cover the things that you can do. And I did show you what was happening, but what we're able to do with this is we can have access to services from Autofac on the minimal APIs. That's actually very beneficial because if you like writing minimal APIs and you like that syntax, using this approach, using the service provider factory, you can use things registered to Autofac directly on your minimal API calls. That is a big benefit. As I showed you, we also have access to the web application builder. So again, if you wanted to make plugins or other features that could leverage that, you have access. The same thing is said with the I configuration. So if you want environment variables or some other type of configuration you want it to pass into your ASP.NET Core application, using this approach, you do have access to that as well, whether it's for features or plugins. I would say for most people, most situations, this is totally cool, totally acceptable, not a whole lot to worry about.
But for me, I'm building plugin based applications and this is kind of limiting for some of the things that I like to do. So what if we didn't use this approach at all? What if we wanted to use Autofax still, but we didn't want to use this way, we wanted to just make our own container builder and see how we could set things up. Well, in this video that I'll show you next, you can see how that behaves and what you get and what you don't. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.